for a session presented by Flyer Labs. Please welcome the co-founder and CEO at Pace Revenue, Jens Monk, in discussion with SkiftX research editor Dan Marsek. All right, so I am right back, um, but with me, Jens, thank you for joining me. It's really great to have you here. So, Jens, you're the um, co-founder and CEO of Pace Revenue, which is artificial intelligence solutions, mainly in hospitality, is that that correct? And um, you're just acquired by Flyer, which has complementary solutions that were mostly in airlines, and so now you guys are bringing those two opportunities together. Um, I think one of the ways that we want to start, though, is just talking about artificial intelligence itself. I think we're familiar with the term. A lot of people understand or think they have an understanding of it. But how would you describe it in terms of how you see it and, and how it's you know, affecting what your business is? Yeah, great question. I think AI, ML is one of those buzzwords, a bit like crypto, blockchain, that we hear everywhere. And they're, they're very nebulous concepts. I think the way... The way I often explain um, AI ML is in forms of in the context of decision making, and I think that's probably the most helpful frame. Whether we're deciding what move to play on a chess game, um, whether an X-ray represents a tumor, how to kind of route taxi cars around a city, uh, we're making decisions. And when we make decisions, especially as a group, we're looking at what data do we use to make those decisions? How do we analyze the data? What conclusions do we draw? What actions do we think are appropriate for that kind of decision space? Now, if you think of, if you think of a team of people executing on those decisions, think of them as a factory. Think of them as an old car factory. So they're all running around building little parts. You know, as you can tell, I know very little about car factories. But whatever they're doing in their manual process, right? Now, imagine that being replaced with a modern robotic car factory. So what you get from that process is, well, the most obvious one, it runs 24-7. You know, nobody cares if the lights are on or off. It's, very me- it's measurable, it's highly repeatable, and it's highly performant. And you can, kind of, you can optimize the performance over time. And that's really what AI ML is, is kind of taking a, de- taking a decision-making process and getting all of those benefits, so repeatability, scalability, low cost, et cetera. That's a really helpful analogy, actually, because, yeah, like you said, I think people have their conceptions of what it might be and a loose understanding, but I think that's a very vivid explanation of it. So we're here in this room at a travel conference. How does this apply to travel and how people are using it for their businesses today? Well, the reason we're in, we're in travel, so I'm not from travel uh, natively. I've been in this industry for now six years. I come from, I come from a tech background building companies. And we're in this industry because there's so much opportunity here, to, to be very blunt. So this is a nine trillion industry, depending on how we count, but travel is a huge space by any, by any standard. And it contains some of the most, we talked about decision making, some of the most complex decision makings around. So if we think about what we're trying to do, highly dynamic demand, we're very granular, we're trying to predict the future, and we have, ver- we have lots of data from lots of different sources that we're having to evaluate. And we don't have enough resources. So I'll give you an example. It's one of the decisions being made, you know, minute by minute is, for January 16th, uh, in whatever, two months' time now, 8 a.m. in the morning, there's three flights in a day, London to Paris. What should I be charging for the seat? So I'm looking at how many seats have I sold? How many seats do I have left? Is there an opportunity for cargo on the plane? What is my distribution cost? How does that look? What are my different channels? Which ones are on? Which ones are off? Uh, And also displacement. If I sell all the seats from London, Paris, am I displacing Paris, New York? It's it's incredibly complex space. No less complicated than, than Wall Street trading finance. But in this industry, we have some of the lowest, the lowest amount of investment into tech, digital, and decision making. So all of that adds up to a trillion dollar opportunity for addressing the leakage that we're seeing from, from bad, immature, unsophisticated decision making. Right, well, you, you explained all that complexity and as neither a tech person nor a practitioner in this space, I don't know how we did it before these technologies. So, um, but obviously there's, there's a lot of transition that needs to be made from the legacy processes and systems. So from an organizational standpoint, there is of course the technical changes and the, the upgrades but there's also the, the mindset shift, but more importantly, the organizational structural shift. Yeah. So how can organizations kind of prepare themselves for this shift and then maybe carry on one step further to start to make that shift? 
Yeah, I mean, th this is um, this is the kind of challenge of you, you realize something at the at the sea level, and how do you implement or affect that change? First, I'll say to the to the previous question, just some background on kind of how we execute in this space, and give you some context on P Pace Flyer. I think that's useful. So we are uh, at this point the the leader in in providing these kind of solutions to the industry. So what we do for our customers across cargo, aviation, hospitality, rail, car rental, is to go in and basically, basically bring all data together under one roof, all commercial, all commercial data, all relevant data, so that the decisions can be made on that data, so that all stakeholders have access to the same source of truth, uh, capture the current manual decision making. So we're basically like making a copy, if you will, of that old factory, the decision making factory, so that we can start to track it and then as a stage transition, introducing these robotic practices or introducing ML AI. So to go back with that as background, um, to go back to the question of how do we affect this change? So we're, we're the CEO now of, of a large travel company. We're trying to work out, am I adapting to this new reality and this opportunity? And I think there are really, really two components here. The first one is leadership and the second one is partnerships or effectively how to execute on it. Leadership, I think we, um, I'll give you two examples first. I think two, two examples that come to mind for me are uh, the first one, Netflix, um, who for all of us, I think in this room and most of us remember the, the old model of Netflix, which was DVDs being shipped by mail. So I was living in New York at the time and I was getting these DVDs shipped to me and you know, watched two and sent back three, etc. That company really should have died in the transition to, to online and to streaming, right? Because it was the old model. So why didn't they go the way of Kodak and all these other companies? Well, they didn't because at the leadership at the time, the CEO said, I'm going to take this zero revenue stream and I'm going to elevate that leadership and that, those people and that team to the senior leadership conversations. So every weekly meeting, I'm going to ask them how they're doing. I'm going to take the DVD team that represents 100% of my revenue and I'm going to tell them they're now an operational team. I don't need to have them on the agenda for the leadership. So that, that is the kind of top-down decision-making in leadership that generated and enabled that change. I, see, I think a similar, a similar example in e-commerce are all the retailers who effectively, we remember back to the noughties, retailers at some point said, I think we need a website because you know, apparently people are on this thing called the internet, so we probably need to be there. I was working with IKEA at the time. They held out for the longest time possible because from top down, Ingvar wanted people in store so they had to walk around and you know, get all that extra we're stuff. All, we're all very familiar it with that. It works <laughs> super well. <laughs> but they eventually, they eventually fell as well and, and built one of these websites. But in the beginning, these were basically somebody in the basement, somebody in the IT team, can you find us a website? but there was no support leadership. And then you know, when, when we get to 10, 20% revenue, then we say, we need a chief digital officer. We need a C-level representative of this business stream or this business unit. So I think tying that back to the conversation, what we, what we need to do is to kind of have that elevated leadership um, ability. Do we have in the leadership team somebody, uh, so right before us, they were talking about having a, I think this was two or, two or three talks back, having somebody as a chief data officer or somebody who is chief of decision intelligence, et cetera. Enabling that or having the right people in the leadership team is really critical for this to be possible and not delegating it all the way down because these are really, unless we do something, these factories are operational concerns and we never know how they work. So that's the first thing. The second thing is uh, partnering with the right with the right people, that's obviously critical. You can build, build these platforms yourself. Some companies, many companies are still doing this in travel. A terrible decision in our opinion. You know, we don't build our own data centers. Uh, we don't have strengths in those areas. Why should we be building our own AI ML capability? Right. So that's kind of roughly the frame there. Well, uh, the examples were very helpful and I think that's a really good point. And then we, I, I just talked for 10 minutes about collaboration and partnership and things like that. I think yep. that's a really important aspect of it as well. So let's tie this into travel. You know, what are the opportunities here? What can we unlock with this kind of mindset? And then how do we do it? Yeah. 
I think it's really important to kind of bring, bring, the kind of, bring it back down to what are the concrete opportunities. I think there's a, there's a really simple tactical one, and that goes back to the revenue, revenue leakage that I referred to earlier. We think of the hundreds of thousands of decisions that need to be made every, any week, any day in a business of any significant size. Most of them are being made badly with insufficient data, et cetera, and that generates suboptimal performance. So that, you know, there's a, it, by our research and by our experience, 10 to 20% or more revenue leakage almost everywhere in travel today. So that's the, that's the one trillion opportunity for us across the industry. So that's the tactical one. Then on the more strategic opportunities, what does this unlock? Well, I think um, one headline here is data-driven thinking or results-driven thinking. So enabling our organizations to not make decisions based on gut feel or who's in charge at the time, but having a more, having a more rigorous process to how we make decisions. Out of that comes things like profit level uh, metrics. So we operate on, in almost every business we work with, it's revenue level metrics without regard to what's the distribution costs, what's the margin, right? And that's a super important one. Then we can look at inventory management in hospitality. How many rooms do I have of a specific room class? How did the margin of those compare to something else? Do I have short term, short term versus hotel business? That's the kind of decision we can start to make. Customer lifetime value, it's been the holy grail for ages. So we don't care whether you're staying in the same hotel every week or whether you're flying the same flight every, every day or every week because you're commuting. The only way we get that is loyalty programs, but we don't really have a way of tying it all together and, and acting on that data. Um, and you know, there are so many examples, but another one is breaking down silos. I think that's a really critical one between sales, reservations, marketing. So the different functions that are all um, in often not pulling in the same direction. So you have people signing contracts, wholesale, which are actually undermining the business profitability. And then you have, you have revenue people or pricing people who are trying to, to discount in other areas. So I think that's some of the, the big opportunities. But I think it's, it's just amazing the opportunity we have ahead of us here, one trillion, one trillion space. And I think the thing to remember is we're at the beginning of this. So who will really win in this race are the people who adopt this technology first. If you think that 99 People, 99 companies out of 100 have not done anything in this space, the company that becomes 98 to 97, they're going to have a huge head start over their competition. That's a great message. So, Jens, we're out of time, but thank you so much for these insights. And like you said, it's very exciting to think about the opportunities. So if you want to learn more, please visit www.flyerlabs.com, and you can learn more about their business and what you can do. Thanks, Thanks you very much. Thank you.